Okay, morning everyone. So yes, hello, my name's Lucy Manwell. Thanks for the introduction. I just want to say that I'm uh, looking a little different than normal. I'm enjoying a reaction that's called swimmer's itch. It's not contagious, so do feel free to come on up and carry on the discussion with myself and the rest of the panel during the rest of the day. So um, welcome to this panel entitled Collaborative Approaches to Methane Monitoring. So uh, as Manuel was saying, with the reduction of methane emissions uh, as an EU priority and proposals uh, being discussed to drastically reduce methane emissions in the energy sector. Uh, the Earth Methane Monitoring Working Group, you know, we wanted to give you, the broader membership, a kind of taste of the journey that we've been on and the people that we've been talking to. Um, you know, and on paper, EO data and analytics, um, you know, both from the European flagship Copernicus program and from commercial data providers, has a role to play in monitoring, verification, uh, and reporting, both now and in the future. But will the reg regulation be future-proof? Will it allow for the inclusion of EO? And can our sector grab the opportunity? Do we have a technology that can meet the needs of the stakeholders within this sector? So um, I'm joined here today by a whole range of experts from this um, industry, from the energy sector. So we've got here Axel, you know, representing, um, you know, an international industry association. Uh, Tanya, you're here online with us, right? So regulatory body representative. Um, Max here from, you know, companies that produce, import and store oil and gas, uh, and also then Alessandro and Luigi who are from methane gas distributors. So we've got the whole value chain, so it's going to be a really exciting discussion. So I want to start by asking you all a bit the same question. So, uh, you know, introduce yourself and your organisations, um, but, you know, say a few words on what the methane strategy means to your organization or the members of your organization. And we'll go online first to Tanya. So good morning. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm really sorry, but unfortunately it was not possible for me to be there in, in person with you. So my name is Tanya Misus. I'm a senior advisor at the OGMP 2.0. So my background is chemical engineer, and before I joined the, the OGMP team, I was working 15 years for, for an, uh, a gas company, mainly on methane emissions. So the OGMP 2.0 is an initiative which is led by the United Nations Environment Programme, so with the support of the European Commission and, and other governments. And so OGMP uh, is the only compre comprehensive measurement-based reporting framework, so which is key to prioritize the, the methane emissions mitigation actions in the, in the oil and gas sector. And so today, more than 100 companies have joined the, the OGMP 2.0, so they have assets in more than 60 countries in five continents. And OGMP is part of the International Methane Emissions Observatory. So it's also an initiative led by the United Nations Environment Program. And IMEO is a groundbreaking uh, database of empirically methane emissions data. So IMEO is gathering and collecting data from different sources. So including the, the data from, from the industry through OGMP, so data from sci scientific methane measurement studies, from national inventories, and, and also, of course, from, from satellites. And the, the OGMP uh, 2.0 initiative so uh, is uh, aligned with the monitoring, reporting, and verification uh, article of the of the European regulation. So this is, in a nutshell, my my initiative. Thank you so much, uh, Axel. No, okay. Let's go to you now. So we hear about regulation and EO being involved. What about from your point of view, the regulation and what it means for your members? Yes, happy to respond to this. Good morning, everyone here in the room and uh, online. Thanks for having me, Lucy. Um, I represent IOGP, that's the International Oil and Gas Producer Association uh, here in Brussels towards the European uh, institutions. My team and I followed the development of the regulation quite closely and um, I can tell you we have been busy in the past two years. <laughs> We are supportive of the development and establishment of the EU regulation on methane. 
It's uh, methane emission management is part of the license to operate. It's like safety. Uh, we want and can manage that. It's also a regulation which would then establish a level playing field across the industry. So we are supportive of it. And we need to get a, to a point where we have consistent quantification. We need to talk about the same things. We need to stop comparing apples and bananas. Having said this, in Europe, we are already very good in methane emissions mitigation. Less than 1% of methane emissions, of anthropogenic methane emissions, comes from the oil and gas upstream sector. Less than 1%. We rather sell the gas than let it escape to the atmosphere, and we're conscious, obviously, that uh, it can explode and create fire, so we have sophisticated safety systems in place already to manage any leaks and avoid them. So what does the regulation mean to our industry, to get to your question, Lucy, sorry for doing a little detour. Generally, it's welcomed, it's welcomed, but we need to get the technical details of it right, and we are not there yet. It's so technical. Provisions and measures must not be dogmatic, but they must be proportionate to the net environmental impact we want to achieve. They need to be efficient, reasonably efficient. Yes, they will cost money, but still they need to be efficient, uh, and they need to be implementable. Three points, proportionate, efficient, implementable. So the good news for the audience in this room here, there's also a role for advanced technologies, not only going with handheld devices, through plants, but also using of advanced technologies such as continuous monitoring, drone flyovers. We're quite skeptical, I personally I'm skeptical about what the satellite technology can do to our industry in Europe, because I haven't seen any picture from satellites which detected any methane emissions from the oil and gas upstream sector. I stop here, thank you. Thanks very much, Jackson. Tanya, back to you. So, with the International Methane Emissions Observatory very much integra an integrated part of the proposals in terms of monitoring, reporting at a global scale, what this audience probably wants to know is, are there still opportunities for European uh, EO organisations to provide services? And, you know, how do ERSC members stay up to date on future uh, purchasing opportunities or support opportunities. Over to you, Tanya. So thank you very much for, for, the, quest, for the question. So as I mentioned already, IMEA reconciles data from different sources. So on one hand, the scientific measurement studies, data from the, from the industry through OGMP, data from national inventories, and data from satellites. And I may focus initially on, on emissions coming from the fossil industry, but this year uh, so we are expanding the activities to, to other emitting uh, sectors, as uh, for example, uh, waste and, and agriculture. At, uh, as you are probably aware, so at COP27, IMEO launched the Methane Alert and Response System, so MARS, which is a new initiative to, to accelerate the implementation of the Global Methane Pledge by transparently escalating up global efforts to detect and, and add on, on major emissions, uh, methane emission sources. So MARS has four components. The component one, which I think is the most important for the Earth observation industry, is the methane detection and attribution. So I will give you additional info on this. So the component two, which is the alert, so notified and engaged the governments and, and the companies. So the component, component three, which is the response, so the stakeholders so should take a mitigation action, so based on the data that they, they have received. And the component four, is the system. So it's a system to track, learn, collaborate, and, and improve, and to accelerate the, the learning for the industry as a, as a whole. So on the, on the, component, on the component one, so the, the methane detection and, and attribution. So IMEO is working with existing global mapping satellites, as for example, uh, Tropomi from the European Space Agency, so to identify and, and verify large methane plumes and methane hotspots. And then additional analysis is conducted uh, using high spatial resolution uh, satellite missions, uh, which are very sensitive to methane and can attribute these plumes or hot spots to the point sources. So then the answer to your question is yes. So there are really a lot of opportunities. So the Mars team is continually evaluating 
uh, the potential of, of the new initiatives and the new satellites. So we don't have an open call for, for proposal, but we are always happy to be in touch with the, with the industry to collaborate and to, to evaluate proposals and, and, industry, and, and initiatives. So the answer is get in contact with you guys and present uh, uh, what people have. Staying with Tanya and staying online, so uh, and going to sort of OGMP. So EO is built into the OGMP 2.0 framework. Can you give this audience a bit of an overview of how EO is built in and whether you know the EO sector is doing enough in the eyes of OGMP users, and what are the opportunities that us members need to be aware of and will be working towards? Thanks, Tanya. Okay, thank you. So OGMP members uh, are reporting at, at asset level. So uh, in OGMP, there are five reporting levels. So level one is when the company has very limited information on its methane emissions. So they are reporting at asset level, but based on emission factors from, from the bibliography to the levels four and five, where the companies are reporting based on, on measurements. So for a company to be called the standard, they need to work on the reconciliation on the source level inventory with the site level measurements. And so for, for us, it's clear that satellites holds the, the potential to be a game changer for, for the methane emissions reduction. So this is the reason why both AIMIO and already some of our members are working very closely with satellite operators. So integrating the data from satellites with ground-based measurements and operational data to reconcile all of them. So we have seen recently a lot of examples of the oil and gas industry that they are demonstrating the significant potential of satellite technology in methane emissions detection and mitigation. So especially in, area, in areas with high emissions, so where there are restrictions, for example, to import other site level technologies, or in areas where they have successfully combined the satellite measurements with other site level and ground based uh, measurements and, and also operational data. So for us, and, and it's something that I would like to, to highlight, that transparency of the data, so also in the methodologies, so it's a key component for being able to work with, with Mars and also to be useful for the, for the OGMP members. So there are still uh, limitations uh, with the satellites, for example, for the measurements in, in offshore installations, and also the detection threshold is still quite high. But uh, so we are aware of several initiatives from the Earth observation industry that they are working on this. And so I'm sure that they will solve it very soon because it's amazing how fast the, the development of the, of the industry is going. Thanks, Tanya. So yeah, recognition that there are some challenges with EO in terms of reaching the detection thresholds laid out in the proposals at the moment. Max, grab yourself a, a microphone. Next question's for you. So, um, you know, in the discussions around the new proposals, Unipa has represented, you know, many members of the sector. Um, and how does your industry go about testing validation and bringing into business as usual new technologies in general, whatever they may be? Uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, and thanks for the invitation. And um, funny to be talking about fossil energy with, surrounded by fossils. Um, <laughs> And um, Uniper uh, is an energy company. Um, however, we don't do oil, we, but we are very big on, on gas. Um, and we are one of Europe's largest gas uh, storage operators and uh, one of largest uh, gas importers. And so we are really approaching this issue from those two angles. Um, and in practice, um, and maybe to myself, I mean, I, I, I'm um, one of the Uniper representatives in Brussels. Um, however, I'm not an expert on methane monitoring, and our team uh, just had the OGMP deadline uh, to submit uh, our um, newest data. Um, and in practice, we apply several technologies um, and to ensure that the methane emissions um, are avoided, um, both fugitive and operational. So we are... Um, one of the founding members of OGMP 2.0, um, and uh, the guidance and experience that that has brought about in terms of leak detection um, is based on a combination of short-term um, and, and long-term um, detection measures. Um, Tanya hinted at it, um, so we are almost fully on the level four, um, um, and what she was mentioning was kind of level five, and so we're in this transition in evaluating how we're gonna get from four to five, um, and what technologies play a role in, in, in that. Um, but it really 
boils down to individual components, um, what is needed, the differences between a gas storage and a power plant, um, so that you can really get those small leaks over a longer period of time. Um, and um, that is where kind of our satellite observation methods, um, we're still in the f testing phase. So we're working on a project right now where we are um, looking at how we can combine the site level manage, um, measurements um, with these um, earth observation me um, measurements, but that's still too early to say in terms of what the success would that, what would that look like. Um, however, validation is key, so this kind of, that's why we're welcoming the EU methane regulation that um, you, know, you can have all the data in the world. I remember the previous panel, they were talking about that we're almost flooded with data. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we are still going to have surprises um, as the data becomes more established, both positive and, and negative, to be honest. Um, but this kind of external validation is super important, and, and, and that's one of the key points that we're um, hopeful about. Yeah, I think it's also one of the challenges. I'm going to go back to some of the panel members before, because I've got questions on that too. That's quite difficult in the EO sector, uh, using our data and validating our services. Um, so... Now we go to the people that bring gas into our homes, that heat our houses, that cook our food. So completely different kind of type of asset, uh, but still a big problem on methane. Um, so, Alessandro, uh, how does this regulation impact you as gas, gas distributors, different to perhaps the Unipers of the world that are importing and storing? And, um, yeah, how is Inrata going about innovating to meet these new regulatory challenges? Well, uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I am Alessandro Morgani. My role in, in rate distribution energy is supervision and coordination of energy policies. Uh, INRETE is uh, a, a distribution system operator, is the third main uh, in Italy and is part of ERA Group. ERA Group uh, is a public-owned company uh, based in Italy that is the first in Italy in the worst waste area, sorry for my English, the second in integrated water cycle, and uh, the third as a distribution system operator. Well, uh, for us, uh, um, the different are very, uh, there are many different between uh, the distribution system infrastructure and uh, upstream and uh, midstream uh, infrastructure. Uh, the main uh, characteristics of uh, uh, the distribution system infrastructure are in uh, any key, key number. Uh, we have uh, 115 million of uh, uh, point of connection in the European Union, 25 million point of connection gas uh, only in Italy. Uh, the pressure in the pipeline is not so high, so are usually up to five bar and uh, very often uh, less than 40 millibars. And uh, uh, the length of the mine uh, pipelines are two million of kilometers uh, in uh, the European Union, excluding service lines. Service lines are the, the part, uh, are the, pi the pipe uh, from the main pipeline in the street to its uh, gas meter into uh, the buildings. Uh, another important, relevant characteristic of uh, this uh, distribution system are that uh, uh, the authorization of gas is man mandatory in all uh, European states. So every customer can uh, recognize uh, it's uh, uh, leakage from the system, even uh, the small, the smaller. And then they call the TSO that go to uh, repair the, the leakage. 
another characteristic is that uh, two million of kilometers mainly or usually in urban areas. So, for instance, in Italy, every building of every street of every town or city are connected to the gas uh, line. So uh, it's uh, very different uh, from the upstream uh, on uh, the underground storage uh, uh, installation. And for us, uh, uh, it's uh, important to uh, remark this difference. For us, uh, uh, it's very important now uh, the, to um, go against uh, climate change. Every, uh, there is necessary a strong action. So we look very positively at the uh, adoption of uh, uh, regulation by European Union on reduction of uh, methane emission. But uh, we are uh, very concerned about uh, uh, some uh, uh, details of the regulation. Because uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> one type of, sol of solution uh, does not fit uh, all cases along uh, uh, the value chain of gas. For instance, uh, in the test of the regulation adopted uh, a few weeks ago by the European Parliament, uh, is ma are mandatory nine inspections for a year on all above ground uh, installation. But the service line uh, that we saw uh, connect the pipe in the street to the gas meter are a part of the service line is above ground installation and is installed in private property and very often into buildings and apartment of residential customer. So to inspect is necessary the presence of the, the customer. In Europe, I think there are tens of million of this service line to inspect nine times a year. And it's simply impossible. This is a detail, but another thing is that in this distribution system, the gas is possible to recognize by the customer by authorization. So, very often, uh, the customer called DSO to repair immediately uh, the uh, leakage. And so it's not uh, so useful uh, the leak detection and repair. Uh, in Italy, we, are, uh, we have a leak detection and repair mandatory since 23 years ago for distribution system, but not with this uh, frequency and not uh, uh, on service line into each uh, apartment. This is only uh, an example, but there are any error of this kind in uh, the, uh, the test adopted by the European Parliament. And uh, for distribution system operator, it's very important to um, uh, try to find the, the just, uh, um, the, oops, sorry. Uh, we, we hope we will be correct this error mm -hmm. and uh, to have a regulation very effective, uh, useful and uh, uh, not disproportionate uh, for a customer that uh, uh, they bring the cost of the regulation in the tariffs of the service. So yeah. this is uh, okay. our... I mean, links back to what Axel was saying about questions over proportional implementable. Yeah. So I think what's being said is, you know, we've got um, upstream uh, asset owners with, uh, you know, sites, a unique area that they need to monitor versus downstream with distributed assets, most of which are 
underground and that there are challenges in the new regulation around the frequency of monitoring, the threshold. And I think it's also fair to say that with the, the thresholds in the regulation at the moment, those are not thresholds that, for example, what the um, methane monitoring observatory would be observing. They are much, much lower. And you guys would, do, you're good guys, you don't aim to ever be flagged up on the methane monitoring observatory's uh, bad book, let's say, in that sense. Okay. So, shall we hand over to your colleague? Our experience. Exactly. So Luigi is going to talk a little bit about some of the real innovation and work that Inreti have been doing in terms of looking at different technologies. So over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, first, I have a presentation, if I can share some images. Oh, yes, there are slides. Have we got those? This time I introduce myself. Uh, my name is Luigi Coluccio. Uh, my role in ERA Group is Energy Project Development Manager. Uh, among the different activities I work on, I tested several aerial technologies in order to research gas leaks in a different way from the traditional system. We use drones, our plane, and satellite. Uh, but today the focus will be satellite and we will see some feedback. Um, Vision. Uh, more than vision, in this case, we will talk about uh, results, evidence. Today, in fact, uh, we will share our story about an experiment that lasted more or less two years, made with the scope to detect gas leakage in our field. Uh, as I said before, we used different aerial technologies. Um, we have gone beyond the single MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification. But why have we done all of that? For two reasons. Environment. The European regulation is arriving, and as a distributor, in the future, we, just, we should face with the same important safety and environment. But also for safety. If we could detect gas leaks in a new way, more efficient, in more accuracy, we could get advantages from the safety of the people. But let's go into the experiment. I can use the voice in order to change the slide. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, let's start with the current way to work. Uh, we have a lot of cars equipped with an aspiration system in the bottom. Every day, the cars follow the road and check if there are some gas leaks that come from the ground. Uh, we also use mobile instrument with an aspiration system in order to detect gas leaks next to the building on the overhead pipes. And uh, in these years, we developed lots of new technologies, algorithms, also a special meter gas, which name is Next Meter, that you can see in this picture on the, left, on the right, able to detect gas leaks in the private plant. We could say that uh, our inspections go beyond the, the target of the current Italian regulation, where the focus is safety. We can consider two families of gas emission. Uh, the gas leaks, uncontrolled gas leaks, connected to damages, corrosion, break, for example, in the town on the left, or the gas that we generated from our maintenance activities. For example, when we remove and clean a part of industrial plant, the gas inside, for example, our filter, goes out. Or when we replace a meter gas, again, the gas inside goes out. We can change the slide, thank you. Um, experiment. We have chosen some satellites with specific features. For example, acquisition timing of every 14 days, high resolution set for methane gas, and pixel 50 per 50 meters. We have chosen the satellite with the smaller pixel because the smaller is the size of the area on the ground the easier will be the possibility to, to detect gas leaks with the inspection then. And which strategy we adopted? This is the key point of this project. We used two different approaches. First, we got and analyzed the data from satellite and checked all the areas where satellite had said that there was a problem, that there was a concentration. For example, in this picture, you can see this red zone. This is an example. Second approach, 
uh, when satellite was passing above our hand, we left some gas leaks that we had detected, for example, the day before, no dangerous leaks, and we generated other gas emission from our maintenance activities. At the same moment, all the operators were synchronized. <laughs> it's incredible. For example, at 11, 17, and 21 seconds. You must have had fun organizing <laughs> that. A little bit. And um, we wanted to understand the visibility of gas leaks from the satellite. This is the key point. We, have, we had, in fact, many areas where we knew the exact point of the mission and the exact value of concentration. We repeated this test for 12 months, more or less, with different conditions of the weather, with different satellite, and uh, uh, different concentration. And in which way we estimated the value of concentration. Uh, can we change the slide, please? Uh, we fixed two conditions. First, the distance. The distance between the mobile instrument and the source of gas. If you want to, to measure a value of concentration, if you want to have a comparable measurement, it's important to fix the distance. Second, we both, and analyze, we both and use a special thermal camera in order to watch the gas with the eyes. I don't know how many people in this room have never seen the gas with the eyes. It's incredible, but it's possible. Uh, in one click in the slide, you can see probably a cloud around the meter gas. Okay, can you see? Because we wanted to be sure that our instrument was inside the cloud of gas to stay in contact with the gas. And in the end, which are the outcome, which are the result of this experiment? The last slide, please. The concentration of gas detected by satellite in this test are to be attributed to other sources. Uh, we didn't see our gas emission, or a match was not found in the field. We found gas pipelines without leaks, or other situations where we didn't have gas pipelines. Unfortunately, the typical gas leaks or a DSO distributor, system operator, are not visible with satellite technology today available. I would like to conclude with a consideration. I'm not saying that we have no fault or responsibility speaking about gas emission and uh, environment. I'm not saying that uh, we don't contribute to the increasing of gas in atmosphere. I'm just saying that today, with the best available technologies, the typical dispersion, the typical gas emission or a distro are not visible. Probably because the gas leaks are too low concentration, mm -hmm. pressure, position, probably in other sector, I'm sure, probably in the future, and we hope, because we would like to use this technology, but unfortunately not today. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Luigi, and it's probably one of the most complete uh, experiments I've seen, but there have been others and similar challenges as well in terms of detection threshold and sensitivity. So. Challenge to the sector, that is hundreds of thousands of kilometers of underground pipeline that will need to be monitored regularly. And probably it hasn't escaped you the irony that in order to reduce to methane, we're going to drive hundreds of thousands of kilometers in cars to monitor whether we're losing any methane from those pipelines. Um, so, Max, you know, we've kind of touched on it now with the results of this experiment. You know, today's regulation sees methane go from being a safety risk at quite high concentrations, you know, the point at which it goes boom, um, to being an environmental issue at really very low flow rates and concentrations. And in your view, do the proposed policies match with the capabilities of the technologies available and the ability for the sector to scale up and implement this in time? Um, so uh, at Uniper, we had a, we, we've been uh, reducing our methane emissions since 2015, and now we have a co commitment to 20 by 2025 to have that reduced um, by 45% and to reach that target, and we're on track to reaching it. Um, however, you're right, um, there's been another shift um, recently, and, and, and ideally the EU methane regulation will then continue that trend uh, uh, going forward. Um, so. 
I think to just pick up on a couple of points that have already been said, I mean, um, I think the flexibility is key in the sense that you need to recognize that upstream, midstream, downstream are different. Um, they require different technology, uh, different approaches, um, and I think that that's what makes this regulation so difficult. It's really difficult to write that down on paper and to just say that's, that's it. Um, I mean, the commission had to revise its own draft again and, and resubmit a second proposal because um, um, it, it's difficult. Um, I think one key point in all of this is that the, the so-called last mile to achieve that um, is, is so complicated that it often, that you have to think about um, whether or not that last mile really is as effective in, in emission reduction. Um, and, um, and, and here I'm only talking about the energy sector. I mean, you mentioned the, the methane uh, strategy. Um, that includes other sectors, and I think that's, that's hopefully, in terms of tackling the methane problem in general, um, that will also come um, uh, down the road from the, from the European Union. Um, to pick up the point, um, it's a super interesting uh, uh, experiment. Um, it, there's also Picaro, which is a methane uh, monitoring service, and, and their data um, um, says that, um, kind of matches that in the sense that it's really about sort of super emitters, or so-called huge emitters that are, that are the, the vast problem or the vast majority of problems and, um, when it comes to these emissions. Um, and um, that's, uh, um, I think, you can, you can do a lot already um, and by, by tackling those um, over the next um, years and as quickly as possible, of course. Um, when it comes to the technologies, um, because I think the complexity comes from these technologies, um, I think, yeah, we also see different maturity levels across um, different technologies. Um, like I said, I think when it comes to satellites, um, we're in the, in, the, in the testing phase um, at the moment. Um, I don't know, uh, questions that we ask ourselves, you know, can, can, it, can it separate between the meadow of cows next to our gas storage, uh, um, uh, storage? Um, and that will obviously uh, uh, impact in terms of, you know, how, how valuable we see it um, going forward. Um, and that connects to maybe one last point, um, also the availability of monitoring services. So I think it's not just the technologies, but it's also the simple fact that um, um, there are some companies that are, that are kind of front runners in this, but there are a lot of companies in Europe that are gonna play catch up over the next years um, as they try to implement uh, methane regulation. Um, and, um, and that will add pressure to monitoring services. So I think that's also, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. That's a good business to go into um, because this is not going to be an issue that's going to be solved with this EU regulation. Um, um, we 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 welcome it. We we want it, but this is a global problem, and this will con this will need continuous uh, uh, um, work. Um, I, I know where there's a lot of work going on with the Americans at the moment, or in, or in the USA, um, to kind of get uh, regulatory alignment across uh, these markets. But but yeah, there's there's more countries in the world. So more discussions to be had. And I think, audience, get your questions ready because I've got one last question for Axel here and then we'll open the floor to the audience and the online uh, audience as well. So Axel, we talk about that there's lots of, been lots of discussion already. Your team have been busy for a number of years and we foresee being busy for a little bit longer discussing this. So in your view, which areas of the regulation do you still think we're going to see a lot of dynamic movement and changes on, and, you know, and how are we going to get to a point where we have a regulation that is a big step forward in terms of emission reductions, but also to use your words, proportionate and implementable. Yeah, thanks for the question. And um, let me focus initially on the ELDA leak detection and repair where we do have a couple of issues. And let's put things into perspective again. Uh, I mentioned the number before, um, in Europe about 12% of methane emissions, anthropogenic methane emissions comes from the energy sector, half of that comes from the oil and gas sector, of that less than one percentage points comes from the oil and gas uh, upstream sector. Of that, again, fugitive emissions, which ELDA is focusing on, is even about 16% about of that less than 1%. So we talk about the 0.1 and less percentages when we target with ELDA programs uh, methane emissions. And that's fine and it's important. We're not neglecting uh, this at all. It is, we will do our job on it, but we need to think, put things into perspective. 
Each leak, leak detection survey means gathering a team somewhere, driving it out to a site, uh, flying it possibly to uh, platforms, having it operating on those platforms or sites for one, two, three days, and going around with handheld devices, trying to find along all these components of those facilities, find and, and detect methane emissions. Um, that is okay, but there must be a net environmental benefit. Now, saying that is easy, quantifying it is a bit more difficult to make that calculation. But we need to keep that in mind when we design frequencies, when we design uh, thresholds. And those thresholds are thresholds at such a low level, which are currently discussed, which are targeting uh, meaningless emissions, meaningless emissions, emission levels. So we need to be realistic in, in, in this way. So what do we want? And there's uh, good news for the audience again. I, I mentioned it before. We want recognition that advanced technologies not only survey frequencies with handheld devices going along components. Advanced technologies, such as drone flyovers, continuous monitoring systems, maybe sometimes satellite technology will help the industry as well. So, so far in Europe, it, it, it cannot. Um, so that these are recognized in the regulation to be used in combination with frequent surveys, not instead of. We don't want to shy away from them, but we don't need to go through plants every X month um, when we know there are hardly any emissions. But what we need is to have a system in place that we, and we do have them mostly in place, not everywhere, but mostly, where we can pick up the major emissions, the big emissions, immediately and not after X month. So those, uh, those systems we should have in place because it's the big emissions which uh, matter which we need to manage, not with cumbersome efforts, the tiny negligible emissions uh, somewhere. Competent authorities have a role in you know, approving the use of uh, these advanced technologies as part of elder schemes. So it's not for us to determine, but we need to have you know, a judge who says, yes, it makes sense, you apply those systems. If we apply those systems um, and those who do should be rewarded with reduced frequencies um, uh, sending in troops flying out with helicopters or even mounting vessels. Mounting vessels, let me talk a little bit about that. There are some other requirements in the regulation which are not implementable. You cannot quantify methane emissions from subsea infrastructures. It just doesn't exist, that technology. And furthermore, the methane emissions typically, if there are any, don't reach the atmosphere because they dissolve in seawater. So, it's the one thing, writing something and drafting something into regulation, it's the other thing to make it implementable. It's not implementable in this case. Uh, it's one of the important points. I talked about the threshold of 0. Point, of 0. 0.15 grams uh, per hour flow rates, which is just the, a very, very, very low uh, threshold, which is too low uh, to, be, um, uh, to be detecting any meaningless, meaningful uh, emissions. Um, I think that's sort of uh, what I talked. I can look at my list of um, uh, uh, issues I wanted in? to address, but I think uh, we, we are almost there. But this is my last opportunity to say something here. <laughs> um, um, I think I stop here. Uh, I have mentioned Thank most of so my much. points. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So as you can see, we've had an exciting year, lots of interesting discussions, uh, great aspirations on methane reductions, room for new technologies, but challenges over implementation and levels and still much discussion ongoing. Are we going to have allow one time for a question from the audience, if there is one? You, sir. Yes, uh, we, as I said at the beginning, I, we used different technologies, also airplane and drones. 
Uh, with our planes, we use a specific sensor uh, able to avoid the vapor of the air, for example. And um, in this case, it's, impos it's possible to watch uh, a gas emission, but uh, until more or less uh, 100 meters. Uh, it's too low to fly. Uh, at the beginning, we tested this technology from the ground. We had this uh, instrument in the car, and uh, we tested different distance. We also use drones, and uh, with drones it's possible to detect gas leaks more or less uh, consider 250 part per million uh, until 10 meters, 10 meters of distance. It means that if you can check all the overhead pipes flying in front of the buildings, it's possible. But if you want to use drone over the city, the distance is too low. But we use all this technology in order to understand which are the possibilities. I just have a quick anecdote to that because in my previous uh, job I advised a TSO in Germany and they were testing drones and uh, they were very hopeful that um, they would fly automatically, come back, give the data, uh, you know, um, and then they ran into the German communal approval process for having to approve um, when you have a thousand kilometer pipeline. Uh, each intersection, because it winds between communes and Bundesländer and, and all that, um, and they gave up uh, basically uh, because of that. Um, it's being revised now, I understand, but that's a whole different legislation which is sort of supposed to address uh, drones and, 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 um, and uh, create some kind of regulatory clarity between the different lender in Germany. But so sometimes it's not even a technology question, sometimes it's completely unrelated regulation. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Bye. Thank you, yes, thank you to all the speakers, contributors to this session. Um, we now have a, a coffee break, uh, a well-deserved coffee break. We will start um, at uh, 12 sharp, please. This uh, coffee break is sponsored by uh, European Space Imaging. So thank you to them. 12 sharp. Thank you.